We're it ready. It sounded like a command. Are we ready? It's like, all right, let's go. Let's get into it. We're the numbers. Hmm. I'm a data nerd. I love the numbers. And that, that's all we're going to say about it. Mm -hmm. I've given my piece. Jess yeah. has given hers. It helps a lot of people that are hesitant to, to grow. Welcome to the Mental Health Janitors, where we help you clean up the mess in your head. I'm Sergeant Q, and with me as always, Doc Jess. Hey, good morning. All right, guys, so we have a great episode for you today. We're gonna be talking about some new advancements in ketamine to treat depression, which I've heard a little bit about, but Doc Jess is gonna tell us more. Then we're gonna talk about some current events in the media. And so this one is a little bit scary when we talk about AI and some of the directions that it's going. I love AI. I use it every day in my business, in multiple businesses I use it, and I encourage my employees to use it. But what I found out this weekend that's happening on the dark web is terrifying. And so you're not going to want to miss that. Then we're going to get into tools for our toolbox, which is going to be Socratic questioning. And so tell us just briefly, what is that, Jess? What's the definition? Sure. And so in 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 episodes past, we've talked about cognitive behavior therapy. Mm -hmm. And so this is just a step in that. And it's technically considered cognitive restructuring. And Socratic questioning is just a portion of co cognitive restructuring. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll learn a little bit about the history, where that came from. Some of you guys have probably heard of Socrates, maybe. And so you'll understand where this line of questioning came from and how this relates to our mental health and really the scientific method of mm -hmm. figuring out what is going on inside this big noodle we have in our brain. <laughs> All right, okay. let's get started. Socrates, really? <laughs> <laughs> Socratic questioning, right? Uh -huh. Socrates, Socrates, yes. right? Remember, we, right, remember right. you stumped me? Yes, the, I did. In one of the very first episodes, because <laughs> we had touched on it. <laughs> I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> All right, let's, um, okay. So let's talk about ketamine for depression. So we know that this is an animal tranquilizer that they use in veterinary clinics and that people in the past have stolen these things. So tell us a little bit, how did that transfer into being used now Perfect. for therapy? How yeah. does that work? Yeah. So in the 1970s, um, it, it was the first time the FDA approved it for use in humans and they used it on injured soldiers in Vietnam. Oh, okay. And so that's when uh, the human use of it started. And just over time and rappers drug use and exploitation of it um, has become more popular. I, I don't have any personal experience with the ketamine use. I don't have clients that have used it, but I am a part of Seattle Christian counseling where there's 50, 60 counselors and, and through discourse, discourse with them, I've heard of several very successful, um, interventions with ketamine treatment and, um, not so successful experiment experiences with it. Right. And so it, it and we were talking a little bit in the pre-show kind of about the pros and cons of it. Right? Right, right. And, and I, any kind of medication, I am hesitant to to throw any clients into um, because it's easy in our generation and in our world that we live in to just want a quick fix for things. And so I only suggest medication for my clients if they remain in counseling, because we also have to do the work to get better so that we don't need to rely on these things mm -hmm. long term. And I think that's something that we share with the whole concept of ketamine as well. Yeah. And it's, it's really any medication at all. Uh, I have that same, unless it's like a pi bipolar drug or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But any of these other medications for depression, anxiety, any of PTSD, any of these things, I'm I'm a huge advocate for using the medication in the short term while you're learning some long term skills through counseling to be able to get off of that medication and be able to use these day to day skills to be able to maintain your mental health. Yeah. So yeah, we are definitely in the same accord when it comes to that. So tell me a little bit, the ketamine, is this a psychotropic drug? What does it do to the brain? What's the interaction? Yeah, so it it does, I don't know exactly neurologically how it affects you, but I, I have heard sayings such as feeling like you're on a trip mm -hmm. from some sources, but also in the therapeutic world, it's more of a disassociation. Okay. And so it's used alongside of therapy to really dive into some of those index traumas. 
to start getting healing and growth through that. So you used a big word there, index in, trauma. Index trauma. So let's yes. break that down for our viewers. What's Perfect. index trauma? An index trauma is stems from, from my understanding, a uh, cognitive processing therapy, mm -hmm. which is a sublet of cognitive behavior therapy. It's part of that process. And the, to try to break it down as simple as possible, I'll give my example of cognitive processing therapy. So I went to an intense outpatient program for three weeks in Chicago at the mm -hmm. road home program through Rush University. Incredible program. Ask me offline if you want more information. But what it is, is it's it's three weeks of intense therapy um, for and they, they put us soldiers, veterans in cohorts of 10 of very similar experiences, right? So as a female veteran, I'm always thrown into these other female group counselings where in no way, shape or form am I comparing circumstances, but there's very, very small amount of us female veterans that are actual combat veterans. Actually, we're in combat, saw combat, experienced combat. And so I'm usually thrown into these female groups and it's a lot of military sexual trauma and, and things which is incredibly traumatic, not underscoring that. But my healing needed to come from my combat trauma. And so you get asked all these questions and it's a really hard interview process, but they do it specifically to put you in a group of other soldiers that went through very similar trauma as right. you. Okay. So it's not, we should clarify, it's not that one is worse than the other. It's just that they're different. Yes. And so they break these people, they break all the veterans up into these groups where you've had similar types of trauma. So yes. if you experience an IED then they're going to put you with people who experienced an IED. If you were in direct combat, then they're going to put you in with the groups that were in direct combat. If you were one of the guys that was kicking in doors, like they're going to put you with a bunch of door kickers. Yeah, exactly. So they're just separating you into these different groups so that we have that shared experience, which we'll get into in another podcast, how that shared experience can be very, very healing in itself. Yeah. Yeah. So go ahead. Really good segue. Um, okay. So I'm in this cohort of nine other people and um, it's this cognitive processing therapy. And what you do, what we did is we did lots of group therapy and lots of individual therapy and lots of holistic type mm, things, acupuncture mm -hmm. and mindfulness, things like that. But um, what it boiled down to is doing a lot of self-reflection of what was my index trauma, which is really the first trauma to, to implant a core memory to start that process of PTSD. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I had several traumatic experiences after my index trauma that were harder or worse than my index trauma, but I had to start there because that's when your brain starts the, with those cognitive distortions. So we have to get to the first root, which is considered our index trauma and so, go from there. So the cognitive distortion she's talking about, that's when your sense of reality changes forever. When something happens, people talk about this as the fractured soul theory, where you've had this experience and the, your perception of reality now has changed. And then that leads to how you start to see the rest of the world, how you start to see other traumas and every other trauma that you experience is going to relate back to that, whether it happens in combat or not. If you experience a civilian trauma, it can relate back to that index trauma. Yes. And so it all starts to stem from there. So finding out what that is and addressing it first is really important to heal um, completely. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's that was it for me that uh, I, I had to narrate and really process through that first index trauma. And through mm -hmm. that process, I realized, oh, my gosh all these distorted cognitive thinkings that stemmed from that and that debilitated me for nine years. Right. right. And so that's why so many soldiers with a lot of childhood trauma and then they join the military and then they experience trauma on top of that childhood trauma. Uh, in statistics, I've read a lot of the 22 soldiers a day that commit suicide, which I've heard recently is down to 20. Well, that's what the VA wants you to believe. Okay, <laughs> we're going to stay with 22 a day. Um, a, a big majority of them are not just veterans with military trauma, but mm -hmm. they stem from childhood trauma as well. And it's just compounding. So sometimes your index trauma, if you're a veteran, might go 
before military service. And that's okay. It's, we got to start there. Right. So does that help answer the question of what index trauma is? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to make sure you guys understood what we were talking about and get really to that core so you can make better decisions for your own mental health journey. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So with the ketamine, I've looked at this these using these psychotropics before years ago, I would try anything and everything to try and get some relief for mental health. And I think a lot of you have experienced that. We're like, what is this new thing? I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this, whatever you can to try and get some control over your mental health. And so I looked at going in and ketamine wasn't a thing, but I looked at doing DMT, I think is what it was called. Uh, and then I also looked at doing uh, ayahuasca, um, you know, they have another one with mushrooms where mm -hmm. this therapist will give you these doses uh, over a period of time and they will do a therapy session with you. And usually it only takes one, but sometimes it takes two or three. There's been a lot of medical professionals that have lost their license doing yeah. this type of work, but it has helped people. So they were really the forerunners of this years ago where they were doing this, knowing they would lose their license. And when they did, they would just go down to South America, begin practicing down there. So you can find all kinds of these ayahuasca retreats and all these different things where you can have these, these psychotropic uh, drugs. And then somebody walks you through that process. Yeah. And so they used to do that with peyote, you know, Native yeah. Americans would use this with peyote. And so this is not a new concept. It's something that's been around for a very long time. Modern medicine is just really catching up to it and it's becoming more mainstream. Now with any of these drugs, obviously any medication can be highly addictive. And so you don't want to go try this on your own. You want to go to a licensed professional, somebody who knows what they're doing, because you definitely want to, don't want to start messing around with these things with somebody who is, is not a professional, does not know what they're doing. And from my understanding right now, the only FDA approved way of using ketamine is prescription through a nasal spray. Mm, okay. Now I've, I've, you know, there's lots of ketamine injections clinics. Um, I'd have to do a little bit more research to find out like what the research is on those and things of that, of that nature. But the biggest, the, the, the common denominator with the injection sites from other counselors and therapists I've talked to with their own clients experience is as long as they're going and getting these injections once or twice a week, regularly, they do really well. Um, and the dosage is so low, you're not walking around tripping out. Right. So it's like, they call it micro dosing. Micro dosing. Yeah. Right. And so we're not telling people to go out and get high. Okay. <laughs> um, the micro dosing, but as soon as they stop, they revert back. Mm -hmm. Just like, just like if you were to try some fad diet and you lose all this weight, you revert back to your to cognitive your distortions, yeah, yeah. to your habits, your default habits. Y yeah. yeah. It's not going to, it's not going to work. And so I think we're absolutely on the same page unless you're doing the work while getting the help in order to do the work. Maybe it could be a, a good tool, but absolutely not by itself. We're both on the same accord on that. Yeah. So we just want to bring this to your attention. This is something that is gaining traction in the medical field. So we want to talk to you guys about it, share it with you. Yeah. So, all right. That's all we're going to talk about on the ketamine side. If you guys do want more information, you definitely hit up Doc Jess. You know, you can find her information there in the show notes or on yeah. our website and she can get you connected to some more resources about that. And yeah, if I don't have the answer, because yeah. I can't have the answer of all these things, there's... And it's not, it's not so something much. that she does. So yeah. she doesn't do this type of therapy, but she can plug you into some of her colleagues who could, if that's the, the direction you want to go. Yeah. So let's talk now about a current event. So this is something that I saw in the media that just shook me to my core and it has to do with AI. So the dangers of AI, and so everybody has been worried and focused so much on, oh, is AI going to take my job? Mm -hmm. And I tell people, AI is not going to take your job. The people who know how to use AI are going to take your job because they're going to be better, faster, stronger, more productive than you are. And so I've been a huge fan of AI. I use it in multiple different disciplines in several of my companies. But this weekend, I was shocked to see what they're doing now with AI. And so I, I really like the market to, to decide regulations around anything. I don't like government to step in and say, you can and can't do this. I really like the free market to decide. 
And so what we've seen now is the free market is responding to this problem that's happening. So with AI, before we had these deep fakes. And so if you guys know what a deep fake was, I think Tom Cruise was the first like deep fake that was out there where this guy took the likeness of Tom Cruise and gave it a script and then it could speak as if it looked and sounded just like Tom Cruise. And it was super funny. He was having to do all these crazy things, mm -hmm. you know, like advertisements for weird stuff. And uh, it was kind of funny and cheeky. And of course, Tom Cruise being who he is, he had to come out against it and be over the top because he just needs more media attention. But it, yeah, I'm a huge Tom Cruise fan, if you guys can't tell. The, the reason that this deep fake has gained so much traction now is because they're using it in the adult industry and not in a good way. Not mm -hmm. that the adult industry is good anyway. But what they're doing is they, take, they can take a photo of a celebrity now and they can use AI to undress the celebrity. Yeah. So now AI can create a nude provocative image or video of a celebrity that's not them. It's completely AI generated, but it's their likeness, it's their voice, it's their digital person. Yeah. And now they're utilizing that to sell pornography without that individual's permission. Super, super scary. And it gets even worse. So that's like layer one. Yeah. You go down to a second layer and you can do this with just the average person now. So just the average person, you can take their image and do the same thing. On a free trial. On a free trial. Yeah. So this is a free trial. Like you can download this stuff, use a free trial. I'm not telling you what it is, but you can do that. It's a free trial and you can do this to images now of people, just random people. And here's where it got really, really bad. And this is where the community of AI developers and, and the, the consumer community really jumped on board is there was a, an advocate who was speaking out against this type of technology saying, Hey, we need to have some regulations. Mm -hmm. We need to have some safeguards in place to protect people because this isn't right. What they're doing to celebrities. They literally took her image, the activist's image, mm -hmm. and they use that in their advertisements of how you can undress people. Yes. And it was so reprehensible. I just, I, I was beside myself that this, not only did it exist, but they were so brazen to go after an, an activist who was speaking out against this, speaking out to try and protect women and celebrities from this technology. And they used her image to sell their product. It was so horrible, so horrible that that's where the free market needs to step in because if they don't, the government's going to step in and shut down a lot of this stuff. Yeah. But that is what's super scary and it's out there right now being utilized. And so Jess, what, what do you think about this? We had a discussion of this offline when I brought this to your attention that we could put into the show. What was your first initial reaction to this? Well, yeah, I, I, I have several clients that I've worked with currently and in the past that made dumb decisions in their earlier life of sending provocative pictures um, and the trauma that brings that we have to unfold and process through years later, sometimes decades later, mm. might have become their index drama. Right. I... My first thought was, A, my children. It's already extremely scary world out there with children, with everything coming out of, about what's going on um, in that world. Um, but it, it brought it to my own life. Somebody can use and e exploit my own children. Um, and then what kind of trauma would that bring? On top of just everything that's happened, I think was it a few weeks ago or last week, Aaron, you talked about these compounding of events that have just made the mental health world so dysfunctional and traumatic. And it, it just keeps getting worse. That's right. It's not, it's not getting better. And so, um, part of me feels hopeless because the technology is out there and people are disgusting and nasty and they're going to find it. Um, yeah. So I'm, I deal with a little bit of feelings of a little hopelessness, mm. um, which is not fun to ever deal with hopelessness. Um, and, and 
I mean, really, really, like, I hate to say it, but job security. Because if this stuff comes out, I'm to our local families, to our local community, it's gonna it's gonna cause a lot of trauma that people are gonna need to seek mental health for. Yeah, it it is. It's one of those things that I didn't see this coming. And now that it's here, it's like, oh, of course, of course, this would be a natural progression. Of course, yeah. right? Because it's in nature that we have as, yeah. as people. But it really, it really shocked me. I was shook. I was like, oh my gosh, this really awesome, cool tool that we have that can is changing rapidly how we can help people and how we can reach people got turned into something just completely horrible. And so that hopelessness, I felt that a little bit too, or first I was shocked and then I was super angry. Like, mm -hmm. where are these guys? Let's find out where they're building this AI technology and pay them a visit. I'm just mm -hmm. telling you, that was my, that was my second reaction uh -huh. was that anger of, okay, I'm going to go take a piece of fire hose and beat this guy with it. Mm -hmm. That, and if you've been in the Marines, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, th but that was my initial reaction was, okay, I went there to anger and then I went to this hopelessness that, you know, it's not just one company. This can be aggregated to millions of companies all across the world in yeah. all these different countries that can be doing this now. Mm -hmm. And then I went to an another place of empowerment mm -hmm. saying, you know, I have a voice yeah. and I can use every platform that I'm on to speak out against this. And I don't have to be a protester. I don't be banging the drum. I don't be talking about this all the time. But when I have an opportunity to speak, I'm mm -hmm. going to say something. Mm -hmm. When I have an opportunity to speak to my friends and my close family, I'm going to say something. And that's the empowerment that every one of you have as well. You don't need a platform like I do. You don't need to post this all over social media. You can have these conversations with your friends and family and just say, hey, I'm not about that life. Like that kind of technology, I'm not giving it any play. I'm not giving it any t uh, attention. I'm not utilizing that type of technology. And my anybody who's my friend is not going to be doing that either. Yeah. And you can just draw that hard line in the sand yeah. and say, this is just not acceptable. And I'm not going to be hanging around with anybody who's utilizing this or joking about it or sending, sending this stuff to other people where they've undressed some celebrity or put them in a compromising position. Like I'm not going to be part of that life and neither is anybody in my circle of friends. Every one of you have that power to affect your sphere of influence. And that's where that empowerment comes yeah. is that we have the power to affect people right in our communities. Yeah. And that can grow exponentially too. That has a viral component to it mm -hmm. as well. If we all just take a stand and say, we're just not about that. We're not going to deal with that. You look at everything that's happened in the child pornography rings that have been coming out in Hollywood and all that stuff. People, it wasn't the government that came in and did anything. It was average everyday people saying, I'm not about that. I am speaking out against that. And they're talking to their circle of friends about that as well. Mm -hmm. And that has really opened a lot of doors for these victims to come forward yeah. and say, I've experienced this. I have a colleague that was in the Hollywood sphere who had this specific experience yeah. and she felt like she couldn't talk about it. Now that it's all coming out, she's a lot more emboldened about it. Yeah. But there's all, so it does that. It empowers people who've been a victim. It also, mm -hmm. it also brings awareness to your friends and family that this stuff is out there and they need to be aware of it and yeah. make wise decisions. Yeah. And then they can share that with their sphere of influence as well. And then mm -hmm. that grows exponentially. Mm -hmm. And so those are two things that you can really, really do to affect the, to to offset the negative effects that this AI can have uh, in our culture. And when yeah. you talked about children, that's another thing that I went to was think of the kids mm -hmm. now. Anybody can go just snatch any images of any kids at a birthday party off of yeah. there, run it through this AI, and now they're producing child pornography out there yeah. at an, an incredibly rapid scale and rate. It's, it's terrifying. So yeah. again... Is there going to be some government oversight that comes in? Maybe. But this stuff is just going to get pushed underground into the dark web. Once Pandora's box is opened, yep. you can't close it and put it back in. But what you can do is put safeguards around yourself and your family and your friends and make it known that this is out there. Make it known that you don't approve and that you uh, are, are totally and completely against this. Yeah. That's what you can do as an individual. So don't let that hopelessness and that fear take hold of you. You can be empowered by sharing this and you can do a really quick Google search and find these articles. You don't have to take my word for it. You can see that this stuff is out there. There's TikToks. Actually, Casey, if you want to click that TikTok, there was a great TikTok that was done that I found out about 
And you can watch this right now and you'll see exactly more in depth what I'm talking about. Go ahead, Casey, roll it. Well, good news for women on top of everything else it's doing, it seems that AI has found a way to ruin your lives. You might think, AI can only benefit me, it's not gonna hurt me. If you're a woman, uh, that seems to no longer be the case. You see, I happened upon this post on Instagram, an article stating that AI can now be used to take your favorite celebrity and make them naked. You just put in a picture of them and then it will show you what they should look like without clothes on in very convincing ways. But it isn't limited to just celebrities. Now this user posted, this new undress AI needs to get banned. It's so dangerous. I only took the first pick and someone just sent me the second. The craziest thing is that the AI is free to test so everybody can use it. It made an explicit image of her. And while she was saying it's dangerous and should be banned, that same Instagram account was using it to promote everything is different after you try AI. Try it for free, link in our bio. They're literally using her call to how dangerous this could be as an advertisement for the thing she's calling dangerous. But it isn't limited to just celebrities. Now this user posted, this new undress AI needs to get banned. It's so dangerous. I only took the first pick and someone just sent me the second. The craziest thing is that the AI is free to test so everybody can use it. It made an explicit image of her. And while she was saying it's dangerous and should be banned, that same Instagram account was using it to promote everything is different after you try AI. Try it for free, link in our bio. They're literally using her call to how dangerous this could be as an advertisement for the thing she's calling dangerous. AI is not going away. We're going to have AI. But we need to set boundaries. We need to establish ethics with AI. And this ain't it. That, that's all we're going to say about it. Mm -hmm. I've given my piece. Jess yeah. has given hers. We've used our platform to bring awareness to you guys. And so you can do the same in your sphere of influence. So let's bring it up a little bit. Let's talk mm -hmm. about Socratic questioning. What is it, Jess? And give us a little bit of history on Mr. Socrates, Socrates, and how <laughs> this came to be. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Um, one of our early episodes, we talked a little bit about Socratic questioning and Aaron and his vast knowledge in his noodle <laughs> brain um, stumped me on Socratic questioning and we I had to do a little research, but that was a funny moment in time for me. Very funny. Um, what so what Socratic questioning really is, is the next is one of the next steps in cognitive behavior therapy. We talk about CBT and in episodes past, we've talked about kind of the psychoeducation of cognitive behavior therapy and you've broken it down in layman's terms mm -hmm. for just how our mind works, how our thinking works and the process in realigning our thinking to be more in reality. Okay. And so, um, what this part is, is the cognitive restructuring, challenging and changing irrational thoughts. Right. So we listed um, all of the cogn the main, not all of them at all, the main cognitive distortions. And we talked about um, catastrophizing and personalization and fortune telling and mind reading, um, all or nothing thinking. Those are all cognitive distortions. And so once you can start understanding what areas you might have some harmful levels of cognitive distortions, then you can go in and start e either with yourself or with your therapist, start this process of Socratic questioning. So why don't you tell us the origin of Socrates? <laughs> so Socrates was a Greek philosopher and he was a really great thinker of his time. And so he asked a ton of questions. And so anytime somebody would ask him a question, he didn't really like to give an answer. He would just pose more questions to them. And what he created was this Socratic method, which was a series of questions that you would ask to get to the root of what their real problem is. Mm -hmm. And so when you ask somebody, and it's funny, you can try this on your wife or spouse, is when they tell you something's wrong, you can ask them a question and then another question and another question. Because usually what they, the first thing that they tell you is wrong isn't really the root. That's the surface thing that's like, oh, you left your clothes, you, you left your wet towel on the bed. Right. That could be something that my spouse is mad at me about that I left my wet towel on the bed. So she's angry about that. But what is it about the towel that causes her to be angry? It's not really about the towel. It's that she feels disrespected because I threw the towel 
on her side of the bed that's now wet. Did I do that intentionally? No, right? I just didn't even think about it. I just was careless and, and put it there. And so once you, you start asking a series of questions, you can get to what the real root of the problem is. And maybe it goes even deeper to that, something that was from her childhood of she never felt like anybody cared about her things because they weren't you know, they were thrown out or broken or whatever that is. You, you, the more questions you ask, the next layer you unpeel. And when you can get down to that core, that root of whatever mm -hmm. it is, now you can address the real problem instead of just the symptoms. My spouse getting mad at me because I put the wet towel on the bed isn't the real problem. It's two, three, four layers under that. And if you can start asking questions to get down to that deep root, you can actually find real workable solutions right. instead of treating the Instead of treating the symptom, you're actually treating the cause. Yeah. And that's what we get to with Socratic yeah. pressure. And that, and that goes to show in a lot of marital disputes. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I have marital counseling, they most of my couples, they don't even remember what they were fighting about. Right. They just remember they got in a bad fight. They went to bed in separate rooms. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about the, the root or tell me about the fight. We don't even remember what started it. Right. And it's, and it's usually three, four, five, six layers down. And that's, I, I like the way you put that. That's good. So what we'll talk about today for Socratic questioning, other than the things that we just talked about recently, just now is what kinds of questions do you ask with Socratic questioning to get to those other l layers and levels? And we'll have Casey um, add the link to be able to, this is just free worksheets you can get from therapistaid.com. Right. And so it's just, it's really good work that you could do for yourself or do with your kids or do with your spouse or bring it up with your therapist. If you think that this might be something that would be helpful for you. And, and what else, what I'll add on to that is it's great. Download these things, utilize them. It's great. But if that's all you're going to do with it, you're wasting it because knowledge is wasted until it's shared. So go ahead and use this, mm -hmm. see the result, and then bring in your spouse or your friend and That's say, hey, really check good. this out. I just learned this and share it with them. That's where you're gonna see real bonding happen with that individual. You're also gonna see real breakthroughs happen and you're gonna start to learn it on a whole new level when you're trying to show somebody else and teach somebody else. And we always talk about building that squad, that small group of people that you know and trust that can help you with your mental health. When it's you're really looking good. at who who do I share this with, somebody from your squad. And if you don't have one yet, this is a great segue into building that squad is mm -hmm. going around and seeing who's interested in doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to get maybe three, four no's before you get a yes. But when you get a yes, you're like, that's my guy right there. Yeah. That's part of my squad. And you start to build this stuff together. So this yeah. is a great tool to build your squad. Okay. Sorry. I'll get yeah. off my soapbox. Yeah. Well, and as you were giving your example of with your wife in the towel, like, I can't tell you how many men I counsel that if they had a friend like that to share those experiences with mm -hmm. would help them grow in their marriage. And so that's a, that's a great segue. Thank you for that. Yes. So I'm just going to give you examples really quick. We'll post the worksheet as we give these examples. And then if you don't have any other questions for me after that, Aaron, we'll dive right into our practical. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Let's go. Let's talk about these questions. So the question first is the, a thought to be questioned, maybe a cognitive distortion. If, if you've watched the previous episodes and I read what those cognitive distortions are and you're like, Oh, I do that. Oh, mind reading. Yeah, I do that. Right. Then you're going to start self-reflecting in your life. What are some of these thoughts I have that are, could, could be cognitive distortions. Okay. So you're going to, the first question is going to be, what is evidence for this thought and what is evidence against it? And you jot it down. Then you're going to ask, am I basing this thought on facts or on feelings? Then is this thought black and white? When oh, hold on, hold on. the facts and feelings, I'm sorry, I'm chuckling at that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, 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 before I knew what this was, I would do this with, with my wife and it didn't, didn't go well. No. Oh. <laughs> okay. This is a disclaimer. Yeah. It did, did, did not go well. Okay? Don't ask your wife, is this facts or your feelings? No. Okay. Good disclaimer. That, not like that. <laughs> ah, that's why we do this. That's not Perfect. good. That's not Perfect. good. You can be more gentle. Okay? okay. I'm like, is this a, yeah, yeah, exactly. Is this fact or is this just a feeling? Don't not do great. And, and it's it. gotta be like how you're delivering it in the moment of, of that individual being worked up on something or you're in the middle of a fight. Not, not this not, one. Not, 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 don't use this. Not, <laughs> That's not so great. good. 
Okay. Just personal experience. Sorry. Good. I just had to put no, that in there. I'm so glad you inserted that. Please feel free to do more. <laughs> okay. The next question is, is this thought black and white, black and white, or could it be more complicated? Right. Yeah. And then could I be misinterpreting the evidence? It's mm, a good question. Good. Am I making assumptions? Right. The last page of these questions would be, might other people have different interpretations of the same situation and what are they? Am I looking at all the evidence or just what supports my thoughts? Could my thought be an exaggeration of what's true? Am I having this thought out of habit or do the facts support it? Did someone pass this thought or belief onto me? If so, are they a reliable source? Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. Is my thought a likely scenario or is it the worst case scenario? Right. These are all really good thoughts. And as we read them again, I think if you're in a fight with your spouse, um, I, I, I wouldn't ask them, could your thought be an exaggeration of what is true? <laughs> right. So, yeah. So I'm, time I'm and place for delivery. Time and place. Is, is, I love the Socratic questioning. I love history and seeing that the knowledge that the ancients had mm -hmm. is still prevalent today. Yeah. It's still very usable in today's society. We have just been ignoring it because, I don't know, we think we're smarter than they were. But a lot of this stuff is super, super important. That's why I use so much scripture in my book and in all of my teachings. I use a ton of scripture because that is ancient wisdom that has been passed down for generations to us. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not a believer, it's totally fine. You can still respect the Bible as a great historical document. It is the number one best-selling book of all time. It's been around for thousands of years. And the scientific community is actually proving the things that were said in the Bible exactly. thousands of years ago. Yeah. There are countless books written by scientists showing that scripture is proven by the research that they've been doing. Yeah. And so I love using these older models for mental health in our society because it just shows that, that transition. One of the things that I love is Romans 12 too. And so what we're doing here is we're really just renewing our mind. We are looking at a situation and we're trying to figure out how do we look at this differently? How do we change our mindset around what happened? From instead of look at what happened to me to look at what God has brought me through. Yeah. And it's a totally different mind shift when you do that. And so I love Romans 12 too. I read about this extensively in my book. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that testing may, that through testing, you will, that through testing, you may discern the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So that right there is exactly what we're talking about when we go through this Socratic methoding, Socratic questioning here. This method is renewing your mind. It's looking at it in a different way yeah. and through a different lens. And also found in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. I'll read it to you guys. It's for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds, cognitive distortions. That's right. <laughs> We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. And so keep, like that is a very strong word of taking all of our thoughts captive mm -hmm. to obey Christ. And what is, I mean, if you just research Christ's life, sinless and pure and whole and true and love and joy and persevering. Like that's the ultimate truth, right? Is captivating our thoughts. And so uh, talking about the historical documents, I love the question about, um, it, was this thought passed down by someone else and are they a reliable source? Right. So, and that's why we'd like to say like, if it doesn't align with the word of God, <laughs> I, I throw it out. So. Yeah. And, and that right there, you know, whoever said that to you, are they a reliable source? So a year ago, I think maybe, maybe about a year ago, I had a young lady who came into my life and she was not, 
she wasn't part of my veterans program, but she was kind of on the periphery of this program. And she showed up. She didn't have a relationship with Christ. She wasn't a Christian. So she felt kind of like an outsider. And she mm -hmm. was living an alternative lifestyle. She was doing some contract work for us. And so you could tell she was very uncomfortable being around that environment because she was feeling like maybe she was being judged. And so halfway through this experience, she comes to me and she says, hey, I have some questions. I'm like, great. I probably don't have any answers, but let's go for it. Right. And so she says, well, you know, I, you know, I want a relationship with God, but I, I know that, that people say that because of my life, you know, that I can't. I said, well, who, who are these people? She said, well, you know, Christ, Christians, they say that, you know, because of this, I can't do that. I said, well, who does God say that you are? And then I just shut up. And she had to think about that. I said, M maybe you should go to the source and ask yourself, mm -hmm. who does God say you are? And dispel all of that negativity, all of that stuff that other people are putting on you of who you should be and who you are and what you do and go straight to the source. Go ask God who he thinks you are. And I got so a report good. back from her, oh, a couple months later that it, that had really shook her. And she had really thought about that. She had began building a relationship with Christ. She has left that alternative lifestyle to my knowledge um, last time I had spoken to her and she was reading the Bible every single day and then and then going through my book trying to trying to heal from past trauma that she had experienced and it was incredible because she wasn't even the demographic that I was trying to help yeah. this was a contractor that came in but because of how we operate and how we love people and how we share the love of Christ with others in our program that she was able to get some of that and absorb yeah. some of that. And she felt from that moment forward, she felt completely accepted by the rest of the team, which she had been already. Yeah. But her mindset was that I'm an outsider. I'm doing these things that they don't believe in. And so I'm just going to be an outcast. That was her, her mindset. Yeah. So okay. when I asked her that question, it shifted her mind. And she was able to see new possibilities. And that's what we're going to get into with the Socratic questioning right here. All right, Jess. So we talked about these questions. These are great. There's a lot of them. So let's get into them. Perfect. Um, today for our therapy, con practical portion of our episode, we're going, <laughs> do you, do you want to flip the script and do it to me or you want to stay? No, I'll, I'll do it. It's fine. All right. It's cool. Perfect. We're actually, we're actually going to uh, give something real life that I experience and that, that I still struggle with even today. Let's I don't do think it. I'll ever get over it. Yeah. So. Hmm. Maybe by the end of, of the year, <laughs> we can keep, no. Okay. It's, it's called imposter syndrome. We all experience this thing. Okay. So tell me a little bit about the thought that you would like to question. Is that my, that my experience or my knowledge that I have is not good enough to be able to share with other people. Like how am I the subject matter expert that could get up on stage and tell people how to manage their mental health? Yeah. That's a common thought, especially in your field. Right. Yeah. Um, Let's start with this one. Other people in your field with the same experience that you have, the, the same amount of engagements they've been asked to speak at, the same amount of opportunities they've been giving, do you think they might look at it a little different? Well, I know a lot of those guys have education behind them. And so that's where a lot of my apprehension, I guess, comes from, is that the people mm -hmm. who are out there doing this, working in these fields and speaking on these stages with me, they all have some sort of degree behind them. Sure. Whether it's in the technology space, they have a degree, or in the mental health space, they have a degree. They have some sort of education behind them. And I, I don't. When I step on these mm -hmm. stages, I'm the outsider. Yeah. When you're looking to hire people, what is a hard role to fill in your company? A hard role to fill? Mm -hmm. uh, coders. Coders. Mm -hmm. what, is, 
What does that mean? Somebody who can build out the technology that I dream up. They can mm. put the ones and zeros in spaces to make the technology do what I want it to do. Mm. Okay. Um, is there a lot of people out there that know how to do that? There's a lot of people that know how to do it. There's not a lot of people who know how to do it very well. Okay. Okay. Is there a certain degree that you can get to do that? Sure. There's a lot of degrees you can get to learn how to code. There's specific schools that that's all they teach mm -hmm. is how to code for app yeah. technology. Yeah. Interesting. And so if you're going, um, if you've narrowed down your process to Megan or Steve, those aren't real people. Megan has been coding since she was in junior high. She fell in love with it. Re found out she was really, really good at it. Started doing it as a side hustle um, in high school and has just blossomed from there. She has thousands of hours of experience coding for herself, coding for other people, and really brings experience, knowledge, and a really good personality, um, really likable, right? Megan. Was that Megan? Yeah. Um, and you have Steve and his resume looks really good, right? He went to a really expensive school and it looks really good on paper. And you've interviewed both of them. You had a lot of chemistry with Megan. You really like her actual work that she's done. She was able to show you a bunch of stuff. Steve doesn't have much experience yet, but he did go to a really expensive school. Which one do you think you would hire? Uh, I'd hire Megan every time. Every time, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So if you look at your field and mental health, who have been the people that have helped you the most? I'd say my squad, you know, the other guys that are, uh, yeah, the other guys that I, I work closely with, like Jay mm -hmm. and Nick mm -hmm. and Jesse, those guys. Yeah. Tell me about their um, education. Yeah, I think I think that um, Jesse has a, a degree, an engineering degree, mm -hmm. and then Nick doesn't have any education in, 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 the, in this field, and then Jay, I know he's just finishing up getting a degree right now. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Can you think of somebody in the last 15 years of your journey that ha is a sp specialty in mental health that has the degree that has helped you significantly? No. No. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of books that I've read by people sure. who've done research. But sure. Sure. As far as like personally, no. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at all the evidence, not just on paper, not just college, if you look at all the evidence, do you explain to me more of your thought process that your experience and knowledge isn't good enough to be the subject matter expert? I don't know if I can. Yeah. Because okay. there's no evidence to show that it's just a feeling that I have. Yeah. Okay. So correct me if I'm wrong. It's more of a feeling and not fact. Right. And, but it's still something that constantly creeps up. Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's explore evidence for it. That feeling. What are, what are some evidence for you not being equipped or worthy of being in the mental health field? Yeah, there are there are some doors that have been closed to me or don't even yeah. open to me yeah. because I don't have the the degrees and I don't have that, you know, experience. So mm -hmm. in the academic field, there sure. definitely are some doors that just won't open for me. Sure. Because I don't I don't come with that pedigree, you mm -hmm. know, behind mm -hmm. me. Yeah. And some would you is it safe to say that some of those doors um would have chosen Steve instead of Megan? Yes. Yes. And do you see the value in that? I see the value in the education piece, but I don't think it trumps the lived experience. I think you have right. to have both. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I've done a lot to gain the knowledge mm-hmm. necessary. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't have a degree behind it, but I definitely have put in the work with the reading and the studying and the research papers mm-hmm. and learning all of these things about the brain-body connection. I've mm-hmm. definitely put the work in. I just haven't done it at the collegiate level. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I wouldn't even say that. I've done it at the collegiate level. I just haven't done it in that capacity where I've gone to school for it. Yeah, you haven't got you haven't uh, achieved the credits. Right. Okay. So let's go back to evidence against the thought that your experience and knowledge isn't good enough. Okay. How many how many hours have you put into learning about mental health? Over the last 15 years, I've probably easily put in 20 hours a week. Consistently? Consistently with the amount of books that I've read, the amount of articles that I've read, research studies that I've not just read, but then had to figure out how to read. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, writing my own book, working Mm -hmm. with veterans, interviewing them, you know, traveling and listening to stories of people Mm -hmm. in their mental health journey. So yeah, I definitely put in probably minimum 20 hours a week for the last 15 years. Yeah. And so so thousands of hours. Thousands of hours. Yeah. Yeah. What is, maybe we can ask Casey to Google search what a, a master's, what, what hours a master's degree in mental health would be. I'm just curious. Casey coming back from asking Casey, to look a few things up to us, we found an average of hours for a two-year, 60-credit master's degree in mental health is about 2,100 hours, okay? And then the math behind 15 years, 20 hours a week, 52 weeks is 780 weeks in total, and that equals 15,600 hours. How does that resonate with you? Well, it really speaks to my logical mind. Yeah. The numbers mm-hmm. uh, the numbers paint a completely different picture mm-hmm. than how you feel. Mm-hmm. What would it feel like for you as you're giving at, at one of your speaking engagements to put a number like that out there? I've spent over 15,000 hours specifically researching and studying mental health. Yeah, I think it lends credibility to the work that I've done, if not for anybody else in the room, at least for me. Yeah. Yeah. It validates, I guess, the work that I've done. Yeah. Yeah. Is it safe to say that's some evidence against your thought process? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So is this thought, I'm not good enough, experienced enough with the knowledge that I have, is it a black and white issue or is there more, more complicated than that? No, really. It's, it's pretty black and white to <laughs> me. It's like, look, I don't, I don't have the, I don't have the credentials. So what am I doing here on stage? And I guess that's always my fear is that when I'm up there, somebody's going to call me out for not having, you know, yeah, not knowing yeah. what I'm talking about, I guess. So do you feel like it's black and white issue or is it a black and white issue? No, it feels very black and white. Okay. Yeah. And oh, what but, is it really? Yeah, it's not. It's it's oh, okay. gray. Because right. there's, I mean, the Choctaw Nation, they've invited me back. This will be my fourth time going back to speak. Yeah. You know, in their, right. at their mental health summit. Right. So. Well, and we, and, and we didn't even really add up the hours of actual boots on the ground. That's leading true. mental health stuff, podcast hours, things like that. So, we're talking just study and research, 15,000 plus hours. Yeah, I'd say in the last six years, this is what I've done full time. Mm-hmm. Full time, full time. Yeah. So, generously speaking, or uh, humbly speaking, we're probably looking at more like 20,000 right. hours, would you say? Yeah, pretty close. Yeah. Okay. Um, Did you have an experience where somebody passed that thought on to you that you're not good enough or that you're not smart enough or don't have the education? I don't, I don't think so. I think that it's just been my own self doubt 
because I, you know, I, I still struggle with anxiety at times or mm-hmm. depression at times. Now mm-hmm. it doesn't get the best of me like it used to, where it would be completely mm-hmm. debilitating, but that's part of the other, that's, that's one of the other things. It's how can I tell somebody how to manage mental health and I still struggle with it, mm-hmm. but I am managing it. That's the reality mm-hmm. is that I am actually managing it very successfully, mm-hmm. you know, with the different businesses I run and all of those things. So I've had to rationalize that and be able mm-hmm. to to overcome that negative uh, thought process mm-hmm. because the evidence, like you just showed, the evidence is that I am successful even despite struggling with these things. I still find great success. I have an amazing janitorial company. I have another real estate company, and then this technology startup plus all the speaking and teaching. So mm-hmm. even with these conditions, I still find success. Yeah. One thing I like to remind my clients with PTSD is that PTSD is an invisible injury. Mm -hmm. And so if we could equivalent, equivalent, is that a word? If we could compare it to a physical injury, it would be like a soldier in an IED accident and he loses his right leg. And... He is stubborn and he's courageous and he is motivated. When he gets back to the States, he does all his physical therapy and and above. He does all the work to put in to be able to learn how to walk again. And in the process of learning to walk again with it and run again with a with a fake leg, um, and he shared with you, I don't feel like I can really teach people physical workouts or things like that. Cause I haven't perfected walking again. What do you think your response to him would be? Yeah. I'd probably laugh at him and be like, you teach people all day just, just by, by living the life that you live, you teach them that they not, not just how to do the workouts, but how to have the mental fortitude to mm. press through adversity. Yeah. And so why do you think it's so hard for you to tell yourself that? Because I don't, yeah, like you said, Mm -hmm. I don't look disabled. Like you can't see what Mm -hmm. goes on inside my brain. You can't see Mm -hmm. those things. And so even that label of, oh, you're disabled, Mm -hmm. that, I don't want to say it was a death sentence to me, but it really, it really, I was fighting to get benefits from the VA so that I could get help. And then once I got it, I got that label that came with it. And then it was like, oh. Well, I can't really deny it anymore. You know, I mean, I've been certified disabled by the government. <laughs> and that does a whole nother, it's a whole nother hit to your mental mm-hmm. health when mm-hmm. when you have that label. So, yeah. If you were to think back about just our 15-minute conversation, can you with any assurance say that you could have a different thought than my experience or lack thereof deems me unworthy to be in this, in this field. Well, the evidence would be, that was the question, right? Is there any evidence for it or against it? Sorry. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, can, can you see your mind changing about that thought? Oh yeah, absolutely. The, I think the biggest thing, were the numbers. Mm. I'm a data nerd. I love the numbers. And that's what I look at in my tech. That's one of the reasons that we are so, so successful is because we look at the data points and we can reflect them back to people. Dang it, Jess. (laughs) We reflect that data back to people to help them realize these things right here on their mental health journey, that that they're not always depressed. They're not always dealing with anxiety. Yeah, it happens, but that's not their whole life, but that's what it can feel like. And so when we reflect that data back to the individual, it gives them an opportunity to see their life differently. And that's why it's such a powerful tool and it helps so many people is because we can show them the data and they can make better decisions for their mental health based on that 
information. Mm -hmm. Just like you gave me that data point, mm -hmm. those hours that gave me new information so I can make better decisions when those negative thoughts come in that I don't have the education, I don't have the experience, I shouldn't be on this stage with these doctors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. And thank you for opening up to me about that. I know it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, and your courage is encouraging to others. And I really, as a veteran to veteran, um, it helps a lot of people that are hesitant to to grow. So thank you for that. You got me again, Jess. Hashtag twenty thousand. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna start a shirt line. <laughs> hashtag twenty thousand. Hashtag twenty. Don't come at me, bro. That's right. Hashtag twenty thousand. Hashtag twenty k. Don't come at me, bro. Twenty k and gaining. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Are you ready really to wrap us up? I really feel like I should be paying you for these <laughs> sessions. He buys me lunch. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I hope you guys got something good out of that because I know I sure did. Yes, yeah, let's did go ahead too. and wrap it up, Jess. Um, all right, you guys, we've had a really, really busy day today filled with a lot of information, ups and downs. Thank you for going on those ups and downs with us. Today, we've covered a little bit about ketamine what that looks like in mental health and therapy practices. We covered the current event of the danger of the AI for women right now. If you are just catching the end of this, go back and, and watch that part. We also covered Socratic questioning for the tool for our toolbox, which is um, cognitively retraining our minds, right? And what it looks like to go down the line and Socratically question each other or what it will look like in therapy or what, maybe some worksheets that you can do yourself so you can start learning how to renew your mind as the good word tells us to do. But we always like to educate you with what we're learning as we go or what we've learned in our process, empower you with the information and encourage you to share it with your friends. Thanks so much for coming today. Doc Jess. It's Arden Q and we're out.